In this video, I do an interview with James Stuber. James and I have been friends for a few years since we took Tiago Forte's Building a Second Brain course together. We've worked on a number of projects together since that time, probably most notably the digital productivity coach that we built together to have a self-paced introduction to productivity. And James also helped me last year with my blog when I was working a lot on increasing the number of blog posts that I put out last year. And we've just enjoyed working together over the years. And I wanted to ask him a few specific questions about productivity and his background with productivity and the kind of coaching that he does. And it was really nice to catch up with him and to dive deep into the topics that interest us both. And I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. Well, thanks for joining me, James. It's great to have a chance to talk to you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, so I realized I don't think, you know, we've talked about productivity so much over the years, but I don't think I've ever actually asked you how you got interested in productivity and like kind of what your journey with it has been mm -hmm. over the years. Like um, obviously been lucky to be sort of part of it the last few years, but just curious what the sort of timeline has been of what you got interested in when and so on. Yeah. And I actually, I actually didn't really have a good idea on where I started getting into productivity until I thought about this a little while ago. I think if you look back, it starts with my Japanese study just after high school. I studied Japanese in high school for about four years. And I realized that even after four years of high school, I couldn't read anything. And so, you know, in Japanese, there's sort of three writing systems. And one of them is borrowed from Chinese, which has thousands of characters. So you might need to learn maybe 2000 characters or something like that to have a general sense of literacy uh, in Japanese. And I think after after four years of school, I had learned maybe a few hundred, which is just not enough to, to get around Japan or anything like that. So I stumbled upon this book called Remembering the Kanji by, by um, James Haysig. And what it was, was a completely different reframing of like how to study uh, these characters. I think in a typical classroom, you would learn them sort of in order of frequency, like the most common characters you would learn first. But Haysig had sort of restructured and reframed this, the way you look at studying kanji into one of, well, we're going to learn them all anyway. So let's learn them in a way that's easier to learn. Um, so he groups, he groups characters by, um, by shape and by radical and this sort of thing. And the end result was in the summer after high school, I was able to memorize all 2000 kanji and, and suddenly I was able to not be completely literate, but I was able to look at a page of Japanese and not be scared of it anymore. Um, and that's a long, long winded way to say, this sparked my interest in figuring out if there were better ways to do other tasks, right? So I was going to college and in high school, I never super had to pay attention to how I study, but in college, suddenly things were harder and I was looking for ways to study better, study faster. So I didn't have to spend so much time studying. And I think all of these factors sort of led me down this rabbit hole of productivity blogs online. I think um, big ones were like, like Cal Newport and Steve Pavlina. Like these were sort of some of the early pioneers of um, productivity blogging, if you will. <laughs> and I got sucked into that world where, oh, everything, like almost everything you can do in life could be systematized and optimized and made, made uh, you know, more efficient. And I, I really got sort of sucked into that productivity rabbit hole. Um, you know, and since then, um, you know, some of the biggest shifts have been encountering like Tiago Forte's work on productivity and, um, you know, attending his class, building a second brain. I think that was the most recent, like huge shift in my thinking on that. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my rough journey from Japanese to productivity nerd. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. And, um, yeah, we, we, we met when we took building a second brain together and yeah. obviously a couple of years ago, we built the digital productivity coach together. Um, something that I've noticed over that time is that, um, with productivity, it's a little bit of a moving target where, uh, there's like the general theory of it, but there's also like how you apply it and that sort of changes over time. And, uh, the applications can change the theory as well. And, um, 
I'm curious if there have been any shifts for you in the last year or so in terms of how you're thinking about productivity or how you implement it or uh, how you think about it or talk about it. Yeah, I think probably the biggest shift has been realizing that context matters a lot. Hmm. I think I used to be in the camp that thought, oh, there must be an optimal way to do a thing, right? Um, and this all stems from that, that original Japanese book where it was like, oh, like if I do it this way, it'll be much faster. So that there must be a similar way for every single thing in my life, which <laughs> is a mistake of generalization, right? Um, what, I've, what I've come to realize lately in the past year or so is that productivity is very, very context dependent. Um, so a technique that might work for someone, for example, uh, you know, getting things done, David Allen's framework is a really powerful tool for a certain type of person. It's not a one size all fits, uh, it's not a one size fits all solution that I would necessarily recommend to everyone. Um, and when you take environmental factors into account, when you take uh, personality factors into account, what productivity looks like for you and for me looks way different than, you know, for instance, the person watching this video or listening to this podcast. Um, context matters a whole lot. And that's, that's really the biggest shift in, in my thinking around productivity. Huh. So, so you and I are both pretty um, deep in the weeds in this stuff, but yep. I imagine someone watching this video might not be um, as familiar with it, or maybe even as interested in productivity. And say someone was watching this and they're like, well, why, why should I care? Why should I care about productivity? What's, what's the point anyway? Uh, what would you say to that person? Yeah, I, I view productivity as a, a meta skill. It's sort of one of these skills that if you learn it, it applies to other areas of your life and improves those as well. Um, you might view another meta skill, like, like public speaking is a good meta skill. It sort of applies to a lot of areas of your life, you know, whether that's communication um, or, you know, talking with your colleagues, this sort of thing. Uh, productivity is like that, where being more productive in one area of your life leads you to shift your thinking on other areas of your life. And, you know, if, if someone is thinking like, well, what's, what's even the point of productivity? Why do I care? I think the biggest thing to look at is, well, you know, you have goals. They may not be well-defined, but everyone has some sort of goal for themselves. And if you want to achieve those goals, you can achieve them either faster or better or with less effort if you apply the principles of productivity. And for that reason, I think productivity is a, a hugely powerful meta skill that's worth pursuing. You mentioned that improving productivity in one area of your life, that that can sort of blossom out into different areas. And, you know, just working with you in a lot of different contexts over the years, one of the things that I've noticed is that, um, well, you, you've done a lot of fascinating stuff. You know, you've got the Rubik's cube there and <laughs> the, the weights and like, you know, you're a speed solver and an Olympic weightlifter and so on. Or, um, but the, and the, those, those things I think have really, it seems like those have really informed how you approach a lot of things. And I know one of the things that you do as well as you work, you know, like your day job is kind of in this engineering company. And it seems like um, that work and that kind of work has influenced how you look at these things. Um, just from working with you, I've, I've noticed that. And curious if you could speak to how that context and that domain has like bled over into how you think about productivity or how you apply it. Sure. Yeah. You know, there's there's a few things you mentioned there. There's the Rubik's cube. Um, in in high school, I I practiced a lot, and I got to a point where I was competing um, internationally and nationally at, at speed solving Rubik's cube competitions. Um, I never was the best in the world, but there's something about um, taking a skill and getting really really good at it that teaches you all of these, like I said before, all of these meta skills um, that sort of help you in other areas, right? So. So Rubik's cubing itself uh, was, you know, on paper, objectively, it's kind of a waste of time. Like it's, <laughs> you're, you're picking up a, a cube like this and, you know, messing it up and solving it again. Like you're, you're literally doing nothing, right? If it was already solved, why bother messing it up and solving it again? Um, but there were a lot of lessons that I learned in cubing that sort of transferred over to things like uh, my schoolwork and 
you know, my time in the weightlifting gym. Um, like one is that it's this belief in myself that I can get better at anything I spend time on. Right. So with the cube, like once you reach a certain point of knowing how to solve things, it's just a matter of practice and, you know, getting better at it. And there's a difference between just practicing, like just, just mindlessly solving and like this deliberate, deliberate practice. Um, and it's this deliberate practice that pushes you to improve and to get better. Right. So, you know, these concepts of deliberate practice also apply to like the weight room, right. Um, you can go in the weight room every day for years and kind of flail your arms around and do all the machines and do whatever. Um, and you'll get a little bit stronger, but you're not going to make a ton of progress, right? It's the people who go to the gym and they're intentional about what they're moving. You know, they're focusing on increasing their technique or moving smoother, moving a little bit faster. Uh, it, it's this deliberate practice that really over time it compounds. And these, you know, in both cubing and, and weightlifting, um, I reached a level where it was apparent to me that anything I put my time into where it's like, if I practice for a long enough time and I do this deliberate practice for a long enough time, the results compound on themselves. And I know I can reach a very high level in almost anything I want to do. Um, bringing that back to productivity, for example, there's a very similar um, realization where if you are, you know, like I'm an engineer, right? So if I pay attention to the work I do and I figure out how I can improve the work I'm doing or how I can make it more efficient or how I can delegate more things uh, over time that builds into something much more powerful. Um, so, you know, if you're building a business, if you're, even if you're just a, a, a lowly peon in a corporate world, um, improving sort of the space around you over time compounds and makes your life a whole lot easier than if you're just coasting by. Hmm. And are there any ways that uh, working in engineering or doing project management in that context has influenced the way that you look at productivity? Yeah. Um, you know, so at the company I work for, we get a lot of client work um, and they're always sort of these one-off custom um, scientific devices, right? And there's some similarities between the projects, but they're not all, you know, it's not like we're cranking out a thousand of the same thing. It's usually a, like a lot of one or two off um, custom projects. And what that forces you to do is to get really good at project management because you might have, you know, six or seven projects running at the same time and they all need to get out the door in, you know, and also be built in a quality manner um, in a certain time frame. Uh, that's sort of like, uh, it, it's a little bit of an unusual situation, but uh, like that sort of forced me to learn project management in a way that I wouldn't have done, um, you know, if I was just a, a regular office worker or if I was just a regular, um, you know, like a developer or something like that. Uh, you know, the big ones are thinking about, um, thinking about timelines, um, thinking about how you can unblock other people. I think in the productivity world, there's a lot of talk about, um, I guess there's a lot of focus in the productivity world around personal productivity, around how much I can do as an individual contributor, right? So the, the standard advice you might see from like Cal Newport's deep work or something is to take as much time for yourself to you know, work on these tough problems, to work on the thing you need to do, like when your energy is really high, right? So uh, a common piece of advice is to block off the first hour of your day to work on really important stuff. Um, but when you optimize for your personal productivity, it's often not the same as optimizing for your company's productivity or your team's productivity. Uh, when you're running a lot of projects, the only way to get them done is to run things in parallel. Right. And running things in parallel requires a different set of skills than just personal productivity. Right. So for me, the first hour of my day is spent unblocking other people. Right. If I can uh, get the parts that are needed to um, my coworkers in the lab, if I can answer a question for them, that frees them up to do their work. And 
in that sense, my personal productivity takes a hit because I'm spending some of my most powerful energetic moments of the day in the morning, um, you know, writing emails or ordering parts from McMaster. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's super low energy work for me that I'm sort of wasting. So I'm taking a hit on my personal productivity, but the whole team benefits and the whole team and all these projects are able to get out the door more smoothly. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it seems like that work has also given you maybe a strong intuition for the theory of constraints. Like when we were working on my blog together, um, you just had a lot of strong intuitions for like what the constraints were and how to optimize the throughput that really helped me a lot. And I was curious if there were any, I don't know, maybe moments in your work or um, lessons that you learned that helped you develop that intuition because um, I don't know, the theory of constraints can, can be sort of unintuitive and you do seem to have like a, a, an actual intuition for it at this point. So just curious to ask about that. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, if you're not familiar with the theory of constraints, uh, one of the one of the core ideas in that is that every process has a bottleneck. So if Tashin and I are making cars and you know Tashin can make five car bodies an hour and I can make um, like four wheels an hour, then the bottleneck is me because I'm only making four wheels an hour. That means there can only be one car an hour, even though Tashin is making five car bodies an hour. So in reality, the, <laughs> the fix is, you know, the fix is not to make Tashin work harder, which seems obvious when you look at it, a very simplified model like this. Um, when you go to a more complex process, you know, everyone is thinking about how can I be more productive or how can I make my team more productive? But if you're looking at the whole system, any work you do that's not on the bottleneck, on the constraint um, is, is a big waste of time because the whole system is constrained by the, the bottleneck. And the tough part about this is uh, one, figuring out where that bottleneck is in a very complex system. It, it's, uh, it can be hard to spot. And um, the, other, the other problem is the bottleneck sometimes moves. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I, I've developed a good intuition for spotting bottlenecks purely by practice. I, I'm not sure how else you can do a better job of it other than taking a look at systems and getting a, a better idea of where the bottleneck is. One thing I'll say is that a, a good indicator of a bottleneck is piling up work somewhere. And usually the piled up work is right before the bottleneck. Um, one example from my work is uh, we had we, we had this period of time where we had a lot of um, incoming sales. We had a lot of um, requests for quotes, and that requires some processing time, right? So I was spending a lot of time um, answering these requests for quotes and you know building out quotes and all this work. But what was happening is my my time was being pulled from engineering work to responding to sales, and uh, what happened was, even though we had all of these requests for quotes coming in, nothing was being shipped out the door. And the reason was the bottleneck was at engineering. And because I was one of the, the two engineers there and I was spending so much time on sales, uh, the whole system was being throttled by this bottleneck of engineering work. So as soon as I shifted <laughs> more of my time from sales to engineering work, that freed open the bottleneck and um, allowed us to, to push push out the, the projects that were due. Yeah, uh, I mean, as you say, I'm just appreciating that you really do have this intuition built up over time for finding the constraint. Like um, I asked for your help with something recently and you just like, honed in on the constraint. And in that case, it wasn't even, it wasn't even a physical thing piling up or, uh, you know, like emails or something. It was like actually like an emotional backlog and you're just like, we need to <laughs> solve this. So that yeah. was really helpful. Um, yeah, and it's often not a, um, it, it's often very hard to spot the bottleneck, um, like you said, because it's not always a physical backlog, right? Um, the theory of constraints comes from um, car manufacturing, where it's very obvious <laughs> that you've got a hundred car bodies over here and there's no cars going out, like what's going on. Um, but it, it's, you know, it, it's, it can be difficult to see that because 
you know, we were, we were focusing on sales because we were like, well, there's no money coming in the door. Like our cash flow is down. Right. So obviously the thing we need to do is sales. But if you look at the whole system, the thing to do is to, you know, uh, to release that bottleneck and, and get everything flowing again. So when you noticed that the bottleneck was in engineering, what, what precisely did you shift to, uh, like even the throughput out? Yeah. Um, you know, what I did is not necessarily the, the recommended thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so what I did was I shifted, um, more of my time from sales to doing more engineering work. Um, really the thing to do first is to slow everything else down to meet the bottleneck speed. Mm -hmm. And this sounds like if, if you're a manager, this sounds crazy because what that means and what that looks like is people will be sitting around twiddling their thumbs. Right. And to, <laughs> You know, in our world where like you should be working as hard as possible and doing as much as you can to have people sitting around and twiddling their thumbs is uh, like kind of, <laughs> it seems like crazy that you would ever do that. Um, but it, that's sort of the, the, the first step when you're tackling a bottleneck is to level everything out to the level of the bottleneck and you'll find that things flow much easier. And the reason that happens is because you're not building up this next this excess inventory in front of uh, the bottleneck, um, you know, inventory costs you time. Um, you know, in the case of physical inventory, it costs you space. In the case of mental inventory, it costs you mental cycles where you're constantly thinking about a thing that you have going that's not done. Um, so by slowing everything down and making everyone else twiddle their thumbs a little bit while the bottleneck gets their stuff done, uh, you actually speed up throughput. Um, you know, the, if you look at the theory of constraints, there's, I think, five focusing steps for um, improving or eliminating bottlenecks. And th that first one is reducing the level to the bottleneck. Um, you know, after that, you can start to look at, well, okay, are there ways we can uh, make the bottleneck more efficient with, you know, if we take a look at how they're working and see if there's any sort of inefficiencies that we can fix or any um, processes that can change. That's a good place to start. Um, and that, after that, there's a few other steps, but sort of the last thing you want to do, <laughs> and this is this is probably what I did wrong in the situation. The last thing you want to do is to um, like say hire more people or put more people onto the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of that's sort of the first thing people do if they do find a bottleneck, right? Is to you know like oh the bottleneck is in tire manufacturer, so we're gonna hire you know, 50 new tire people to make tires. Um, the problem with that is one, it's expensive, right? <laughs> people are expensive. Training is expensive. Um, onboarding people is expensive. And if you've ever been in a situation where you are the bottleneck, right? You're, you're absolutely like super, super busy. You're, you're working all the time as much as you can uh, to add new people to the mix is actually sort of a step back. So what, what happens is the bottleneck gets worse and you're spending all this extra money, um, you know, like long-term it can work out, but that's sort of like a last resort for clearing up bottlenecks. But what happens in practice is normally you can clear up a bottleneck by doing other things first. Um, and then if it's still, after a while is still a problem, then you can start thinking about throwing more employees at it. Right, right. Huh. Um, so taking a step back, um, you do like coaching now, right? Is that just um, with productivity or other things as well? Yeah, it's, it's, it's largely productivity. Um, I've, <laughs> I've been advised by uh, Chris Sparks to change it to performance coaching, but it's, mm -hmm. it's essentially productivity coaching. Yeah. So, you know, we're taking a look at what you're doing and figuring out how we can do it more efficiently or in a way that's um, taking less energy or in a way that's more aligned with your goals. What are some common themes that you're noticing with the people that you work with? I think the biggest one is a lack of clarity. Um, and this is super common. Um, people will come to me and they'll say like, oh, I want to be better at note taking or I want to learn Rome or, um, you know, I just want to be more productive. What does that mean? <laughs> like a, a big part of what I'm doing with my clients is getting clarity on what they actually want. Um, you know, for instance, if I were coaching you, I would, you know, take some time to figure out like, what are, 
what are you like your goals? Like what are your deeper values in your life? Um, and why are you trying to achieve these goals? You know, saying something like I want to be more productive doesn't tell me anything because you can be uh, really productive at uh, solving Rubik's cubes, right? Um, I would tell you to go learn speed cubing, right? <laughs> but that would make you more productive, but not at the thing you actually cared about, right? right. So it's a lot of getting clarity and figuring out, okay, what is what is the thing you're actually trying to achieve here? And, um, you know, I'm like, like, I'm the coach, but I'm not the one with the answers. Like, the, the client is the one with the answers. I'm just there to pull it out of them. So it's pretty common that people are needing like more refined clarity about what they're doing and then specific interventions come from that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, clarity is probably like to me, clarity is like a, a core principle of productivity. If you're not clear on what you're doing, you can't be productive. You can get stuff done, but it's very uh, ad hoc and all over the place. As soon as you get clear, everything makes, everything becomes easier. Um, like on a, on a very individual task level, um, one of the conditions for flow is having a clearly defined problem, right? You can't even, you can't even enter a flow state if you don't have clarity on what you're doing. Um, and on a like sort of higher level, like, like goals thinking, um, if you're not clear on what your goals are, it's very easy to, um, hop back and forth from, you know, shiny toy to shiny new toy. Right. And I, I've definitely fallen into this trap a few times and, uh, you know, you end up, you end up putting a lot of effort one way, putting a lot of effort another way and not making any progress towards your real goals because you never clarified what your real goals were in the first place. Right. Right. Um, so once you get clarity with the people that you're working on and like shared understanding of what they want and what they're aiming for, are there any, um, specific interventions that you find yourself, uh, implementing or, um, yeah. You know, like historically, um, I would start to <laughs> historically, I would sort of install, uh, like a, like a very, a very GTD esque, uh, productivity system for everyone. Um, nowadays I'm more, I'm more relying on, on the context of the person that I'm working with. And instead of, you know, handing them a one size fits all thing, like we would in like a, you know, like the digital productivity coach is an example where we, we have this like one size fits all solution. Um, that's great for most people, but it's not the perfect thing for most people, or it's, you know, it's not, uh, the 90% awesome thing for most people. So mm -hmm. when I'm working individually with a client, there's often, um, a lot of changes in the way they think or the way they work that, um, would cause me to change different things. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say there's like a, like one obvious thing I would apply to everyone, but, um, yeah, I mean, big ones are, are getting clarity. Um, if they don't know how to uh, do some form of task management or project management, then we'll work on those tag. We'll work on those things. Um, you know, those are sort of foundational to productivity, which again is this meta skill that helps us achieve our goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, that makes sense. Huh. I'm curious about. I, I, I like how you're describing the digital productivity coach as like a like kind of a good solution for most people, but not the perfect solution for most people. And yeah. I'm curious in your own productivity workflows and setups, like how you would describe the, like the Delta or difference between what we describe in the coach and your own setup, like, mm -hmm. and, and not so much, like you can describe the specifics if you want, but more in terms of like the differences of approach and what you need versus what we describe there. Yeah. Um, you know, and my productivity system is actually kind of in flux right now because I'm sort of changing my own priorities, but, um, you know, one, one big difference is, uh, I'm not so, uh, <clears throat> what's the word I, I'm getting, I'm getting less and less reliant on, on tools like Evernote and more and more reliance on, uh, tools like Rome, um, which are, I don't even think we mentioned that in the course. Um, and th this is just because Rome fits my own personal goals better than a tool like Evernote does. Um, you know, a tool like Evernote is still amazing. Um, but you know, for my specific needs, it doesn't exactly work. Um, another one is the, the, the weekly review that we suggest in, in, um, in the DPC. Um, I find for me, I, uh, a, a weekly review is not something I can stick to as a habit. Um, 
So what I do is I actually split it up into two separate things. Um, and it's something I do whenever I feel like it in the week. Um, so I split my weekly review into like a review and a, a weekly planning. And, um, you know, often it falls on a, on a Friday or like on a weekend. Um, but it's never like, for me, it's never a, a consistent weekly habit. It's sort of a thing I do like when I'm in the right mood for it. Um, yeah. And I would say like, you know, a big difference between what I would prescribe to someone who's new to this stuff and what I do is that I'm less stringent on uh, like very strict planning or scheduling. Um, I'm much more able to figure out what I need to work on right now based on my like energy levels, like how tired I am and also my mood, like um, how playful I feel or how like robotic I feel. Um, those will influence the way I choose to work on one task or another. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Huh. Um, we've been talking a bit in the last months about um, revamping the digital productivity coach and yeah. curious if you could describe for people watching uh, where you see that going and what kind of changes you're hoping to make. Yeah. So right now the, the digital productivity coach is sort of like a, it's almost like a choose your own adventure style um, coach. Like if we, we both touching and I tried to um, take the, the advice we would give to someone who was receiving coaching and sort of distill it into a, a one size fits all course. Right. Um, what I'd like to see is, you know, I can see sort of two paths forward for the DPC. One is, um, adding a lot more video into it. Right now, there's a lot of um, text descriptions of how you would set up your Evernote or how you would set up your calendar. And I think that it could be greatly improved by including video workflow of one of us actually setting those things up. Uh, that would be super helpful for people. And sort of the other direction I see it going is, is turning it into sort of a, a cohort-based course where um, you get a small group of people who are all wanting to learn these tools, learn these things, and you know, um, you or I could help facilitate their learning with, along with the digital productivity coach and maybe some live lectures or some live exercises, something like this. Um, I think a, a cohort-based group of people really dedicated to um, putting together their productivity system and getting something running would be really beneficial. Nice, nice. Yeah, um, I know, I've been really excited to be talking about how to revamp it with you and yeah, I think it's sure. going to be a really good asset for people. Well, thanks for making time to talk to me. It was really fun to chat about all these things and um, just really want to uh, um, share, you know, your wisdom with the world. And I know it's really helped me to be better at the things that I'm doing in my life and um, grateful that you're available to help people as well with, through your coaching and through the digital productivity coach. So thanks for taking time to talk with me. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on, Tashin.